Thank you so much. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. My name is David Cobb. When I do these presentations, I like to say that I am a proud, I am a patriotic, and these days, by golly, I am a pissed off American citizen. Oh, good. Good. I am so glad to get that kind of response to that comment because I'll tell you another thing, y'all. I think that I would also be obliged to tell you that I also will personally tell you that I consider myself a political progressive American. You know, I also like to say that I am proud and patriotic and these days I'm also a sad American. Because you see, I can remember what it was like to say that I was proud and patriotic without any other qualifier. And for me personally, that's when I was a little boy. When I was taught that I was from the United States of America. And that meant that I was from the land of the free and the home of the brave. And not only that, I was taught that the United States of America, my country, stood for liberty and justice and equality. And I was so proud to be from that country. And not only that, but my country was like some great shining light on the hill. And my country was going to guarantee liberty and justice and equality for the entire planet. I was so proud. I was so happy. And I'm angry now because I grew up and realized I had been lied to. But... I want to be clear, it's not really the lie in the typical sense. So instead, let's say I was subjected to a creation myth. <laughs> and I do, want to, I do want to be really gentle about that because I don't think it was a lie because you see, I actually have a face. I have a voice. I have a name that I associate that creation myth with most acutely, most, most vividly. And for me personally, that name is Mrs. Armstrong. She was my fifth grade teacher. You know, and I, I want to say, before I go on, are there any current, former, or future public school teachers in this crowd? Can we get a show of hands? And now can we put our hands together for every hand that's up there? I mean that. I want to thank each one of those hands that went up for two important reasons. Number one, I don't think that we thank public school teachers often enough in this country. We damn sure don't pay you enough money. But the second reason I asked for that round of applause is in honor of Mrs. Armstrong. Mrs. Armstrong was a public school teacher. And like every public school teacher I've ever met, she became a teacher because she wanted to help nurture children to become productive members of this society. You see, Mrs. Armstrong taught that creation myth, and it worked on me, it worked on my classmates, and as I'm watching how you're all reacting, it worked on most of you. Yeah. It worked on us because we wanted to believe it. So I recognize that it, we really need to learn to be persuasive. So I'm going to try to persuade you that we can actually succeed. And since I'm going to try to be persuasive, I need to acknowledge something that I knew intuitively as a trial lawyer and scientists are now proving beyond a shadow of a doubt. I'm specifically thinking about the work of George Lakoff and other cognitive scientists. And that is, if you really want to be persuasive, facts don't matter so much. <laughs> I got to tell y'all, when I first heard that, I was like, oh no. See, I've invested a lot of time in learning facts. <laughs> Many of you, I think, have done so as well. But what, if you really read Lakoff and, and his fellow scientists, it's not really true that facts don't matter. But instead, what they say is that what really matters are stories. Another way to say that is that we all understand the world through the stories that we tell each other. And so when we are confronted with new facts or new information, we process that information based on our pre-existing story, based on the narrative we already have about how the world operates. So it's not that facts don't matter. Facts do matter. But we have to present facts in keeping with a story that our listener already knows and understands, their worldview, their narrative. So in that case, I'm going to tell a story. I'm going to tell a story on how it came to be that large transnational corporations are not merely exercising power today. I'm going to tell a story about how it came to be that these unelected and unaccountable corporate CEOs are ruling us. 
They're not just exercising power. Corporate CEOs are ruling us because they are making the public policy decisions that affect all of our lives. They're deciding how much poison will be in the water that we're all drinking or the air that we're all breathing. Corporate CEOs decided what your transportation choices will be. Corporate CEOs decide what our energy policy will be in this country. Corporate CEOs decided whether or not this country went to war. And we the people were left to choose between paper or plastic at the grocery store. If you've heard that a corporation is a legal fiction, please raise your hand. Look at all those hands go up. So a corporation is a legal fiction. A corporation is a legal fiction. That's something that we hear a lot of. All right, so if a corporation is a legal fiction, that begs this question. What does the word fiction mean? <laughs> Seriously. Unreal. Not true. Made up. Check it out. In law school, we, taught, we are taught that a corporation doesn't actually exist in the physical world. So we're going to pretend like this group of people, material, resources, capital, money, contractual obligations, cultural assumptions, we're going to pretend like this big mass of concept is actually physically one thing so that we can treat it a certain way under law. And of course, if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, yes. poof! We just created a corporation. Point I'm making is that a corporation is a construct. It gets created by our cultural belief, our willingness to go along with it, to pretend like it's just one thing. And the word corporation is from Latin because the first corporations ever created by the genius of human creativity were created during the Roman Republic. Corporations took private money for a public use but did so on a voluntary basis. And folks, this at its core as a concept was a genius way to think about how to gather together material, resources, how to arrange things to do public projects that were beyond merely governmental projects. Corporations are not bad by definition, right? Corporations are just instruments. The problem is what we do with them, right? Because frankly, looking at this concept is not exactly the way the modern transnational corporation operates, is it? That's because the modern transnational corporation actually comes out of the 14th, 15th, and 16th century of Europe. You know, the age of discovery. I have to put discovery in those imaginary quotation marks because, after all, what did they in Europe discover? Africa, Asia, later North and South America. Newsflash, there were people living there. They weren't lost. Those people didn't need to be discovered. And so, in the interest of that truth-telling, in the interest of being courageous to actually acknowledge it, let's just tell the truth that that age, the 14th, 15th, and 16th century, is the age of rape and pillage and plunder and murder. For my money, there's one word that sums that up, and it's empire. And that's what that means. Imperialism is brutal. It means beating people down. It means killing them if you have to. It means stealing their resources and making it it's your own. That's what imperialism means. And it's brutal, and it's horrific, and it's ugly. And stay with me here. Because the transnational corporation of today was not just accidentally created during the age of empire. The modern transnational corporation was created as an instrument of empire. The modern transnational corporation was created in order to facilitate imperialism. In fact, one of the very earliest and best known of the modern corporations was an outfit known as the East India Company literally designed to participate and facilitate the, the absolute military conquering of the entire subcontinent of India and get this, not only to conquer them in the material sense but also to destroy the existing institutions that those people had that had been meeting their needs before the British arrived. To destroy those institutions and to make the, those people now dependent upon new, quote, proper British institutions. To change their story. 
No longer of being a self-sufficient, self-reliant, proud and independent people, but to subject them to the subjugation of the British Empire and even deeper to create institutions that force them to participate in their own oppression, to force them into new legal, political and economic models altogether. Point I'm making is the British East India Company understood that they didn't just need to colonize the people's bodies, they had to colonize their minds. And may I suggest that a big part of the problem in the United States of America is that we are colonized. And I say we as a pronoun because I believe I'm part of it too. I don't think that I or you in this room are somehow exempt from it because we're coming to meetings like this. Let's just acknowledge that we've all been told a story over and over again about how our history operates and it's affected us. And we've got to have the courage to actually confront the story of how the world has been operating, how it's operating now, come to terms with that so we can move forward. Another of those early corporations, by the way, was known as the Africa Trading Company. Would anybody like to guess what the Africa Trading Company traded? <laughs> Say it louder. Thank you. Because I, I'm going to use myself as an example, and this is not anything I'm proud of, but I will, and I think it's important for me to be willing to say this, but I promise you, even though I knew the question I was about to ask, as I say, I give this presentation all across the country, but if I just hear, if I'm not really thinking clearly, if I'm just sort of being lazy intellectually, and the question is asked, and what did the Africa Trading Company trade? The word that pops into my mind is slaves. The Africa Trading Company traded slaves. And I'm not proud of that, but you see, I am colonized. We are colonized. Yeah, that word pops into my head, and it doesn't make me a bad person. I'm not a bad person. In fact, I'm a good person. But I'm, I'm, I'm owning that that word pops into my head because I think it's important that I, as a white person, admit that. Because now that I've made such a big deal about that particular word, slaves, and that question, let me ask, was Africa populated by slaves? No, no Africa was populated by? People, right? Africa was populated by people. And may I say, Africa was populated by people who were basically just like me. And I say that word with full awareness of my skin color. I say that with full awareness of my pigment. But I say that with conviction, with confidence, because if you ask any scientist, if you ask any biologist, she or he will tell you race does not exist. Sure, skin color exists. Ethnicity exists. Those things definitely exist. But no scientist would ever elevate those to a taxonomy or a classification. So race does not exist. But check this out. Racism damn sure does. How can that possibly be? Well, remember, if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, poof, we've just created race as a construct. And may I say, I think I know why race was created. Just as the corporation was created for a reason, race is created for a reason. And that reason is to try to justify slavery. And in order, I'm not saying that, that the corporations or that era created slavery. I mean, slavery had pre-existed that particular moment of uh, European imperialism, but that was different. Sir, what's your first name? John. John. So in order to illustrate the differences, let's imagine for a moment that John and I live in separate tribes. And there's a river separating uh, John and David, and, and my tribe will go to war against John's tribe, and my tribe will win this war, and... By the way, why do y'all think my tribe might win this war? What are some reasons why one tribe would win? God is on my side. That's a big one. What's another reason why uh, my tribe might win this war? Ah! I like the Spokane crowd. That's right. I am telling the story. And so unfortunately for you, John, I really am telling the story. So my tribe wins this war. I put a spear up against John's throat and I say, John, you're now my slave. So folks, in this little story, what is the intellectual philosophical justification for David to enslave John? 
Might makes right. The spear, nothing else. Point I'm making is this. To recognize that slavery up before imperialism was almost always based on nothing other than I gotcha, power over. There wasn't even an effort to philosophically justify it. But during the age of enlightenment that is beginning around the same time as imperialism, if that's not an oxymoron, we can come back to it. But the point is, during this era, it becomes necessary to provide the intellectual framework. And check it out. The ridiculousness of race as a construct is created in order to justify the ridiculous idea that it was okay to enslave an entire group of people over something as flimsy as pigment or skin color. Race gets created as a reason just as surely as the corporation is created for a reason as constructs. What I'm getting at is this. Imperialism, racism, and corporatism are inextricably linked. And what links them? Plain and simple, oppression. I think that we need to come to terms with we are living in systems and structures that are inherently oppressive. It doesn't make us bad people, but we have to understand that. And I want to say that I'm not the first American to make that observation because one of the great American political orators of all time said basically the same thing in what I believe is his best political speech. Now, it's not this fellow's most famous speech because his most famous speech is, I have a dream. Who am I talking about? Of course, Martin Luther King Jr. And if you haven't read I Have a Dream, I encourage you not only to read it, but to find a copy and listen to it. It really is a fine bit of oratory, and it's inspiring the rhythm, what it, it calls for us. It's a beautiful speech. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. But honestly, folks, as good as that speech is, it's not his best political speech. Because for my money... King's best political speech was not delivered in Washington, D.C. King's best speech was delivered in New York City, specifically in Harlem, very specifically at the Riverside Church. Uh, I see several of you know this speech. I'm talking about beyond war or beyond Vietnam. And in that speech, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, the United States of America is suffering from a spiritual and moral decay. This is very powerful language for... A minister. The United States is suffering from a spiritual and moral decay. And he said that decay is a result of the triple evils of racism, militarism, and extreme materialism, or just plain old greed. And King said the United States cannot become the country that we want it to be. King said the United States cannot be become the country that we deserve it to be. King said we can't become the country that God intends us to be until we address those triple evils. And folks, King was right then and he's right now. We have got to come to terms with the oppressive nature of an economic, political, and economic system. And let's just acknowledge that I finally got around to talking about America in my little story. <laughs> and so, since I've finally gotten around to talking about America, let me ask this quick pop quiz. How many colonies in the founding of America? Thirteen. That was a gimme, y'all. Everybody knew that, right? So here's my real question. Of those 13 colonies, how many of them were corporations? It's a trick question because I will tell you all of them. All of them. And why? Because the word corporation means to have or create body. And I will tell you that it took the king to create each one of them. And the king created each of those original colonies by the use of a legal instrument. Do you all know what that legal instrument is called? A charter. That's right. In order to really illustrate what I'm getting at here, let's do another quick exercise together. In this exercise, I'll be the king. <laughs> Why do you all think I might be the king? Because I'm telling the story. See how important that is? I'm just saying that we might do better off as a society and as a movement if we start to question who are telling us these stories all the time. What are their motivations? That might be helpful. Just saying. So the point I'm making is this, right? That the king created each of these. And to illustrate, I'll show you how it works. Uh, I'll be the king. And now, John, it'll be good to sit where you sit. I'm going to make you a governor. Watch this. 
I am the king and I have all political authority. My authority comes completely from God and I am going to use a legal instrument known as a charter in order to create a new entity, to give body to a completely new entity. This new entity, of course, is going to need administration. But I'm not going to bother with the day-to-day -day administration and affairs of this new entity. I mean, after all, I'm the king. I've got other people to rape and pillage and plunder and murder and such. Kingly duties, don't you know? So I will take out my writing instrument and a piece of paper and literally create a charter. And in this charter, I will create this new entity, but I will now assign John to be the royal governor of this new entity. And now I'll quote directly from the actual charter that created Massachusetts. I will assign John the task to plant, to rule, and to govern this new area known as Massachusetts. John, as the royal governor, will have the duty to plant, rule, and govern this area in the name of the king, to benefit the king, and to benefit the shareholders of the joint stock company known as the Massachusetts Bay Trading Company. Massachusetts began as a for-profit corporation, an imperial corporation, to vacuum out the resources of this land and send the profits to the shareholders. Likewise, Virginia began not as the Commonwealth of Virginia, but the Virginia Company. It was also a specific for-profit corporation. Rhode Island began as the Providence in Rhode Island Plantation. Right? I mean, look, Pennsylvania and Maryland were both land grants. A couple of them were, uh, were not ex explicitly for-profit corporations, although get this, Georgia began as a penal corporation. Another quick little interesting aside, what pigment do you think the original slaves or enslaved people had who were working the Georgia Penal Corporation? They were white. I'm telling you folks, those of us who are white, we ought to actually come to know our own history a little bit and we would actually understand like why white supremacy got actually created in order to keep us apart from other human beings that we are actually in relation with. That's a very important idea. The point I'm making though here is to really come to terms with the fact that the idea of the corporation as a construct was used to begin the birth of the colonial conquest of the North American continent, right? And so, you know, one thing I like to point out is the American revolutionaries were not calling for a more socially responsible king. <laughs> Maybe today we might do more than just ask for more socially responsible corporations. Think about it. Because I don't know about you, but I'm done with doing all the research, data, and organizing to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that these corporations are causing asthma amongst children in certain locations. And would you please not do that? I'm done with correct, collecting the data to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that cancer clusters are existing in certain places where certain corporations are doing business. And would you please not do that? Or how about this? Massey Coal Corporation. Would you please not kill quite so many coal miners in your day-to-day -day activities, or better yet, British Petroleum Corporation, would you please not destroy the entire Gulf of Mexico? I mean, really, is that all we're asking for? A little less death? A little less destruction? Can't we raise our aspirations a little higher? Can't we actually be for what we're for? Yeah, right? Let's raise up our voices. Let's raise up our voices and actually be for what we're for. The American revolutionaries were not calling for a more socially responsible king. But those people who would become revolutionaries, about 15 years before the American Revolution actually erupted, those same folks were writing letters to the king that went something like this. Oh, Father King, we, your humble and obedient children, come before you on bended knee to ask that you intervene on our behalf because your royal governor is administering unfair laws. 
unfair business laws. It wasn't just taxation without representation, by the way, folks. That was actually superficial. The real complaint, unfair business and foreign trade laws that were benefiting the East India Company over merchants and tradesmen and craftsmen uh, on this continent. Quick pop quiz. What percentage of those colonists do you, or what percentage of the English Parliament making those laws do you think owned shares in the East India Company? <laughs> All of them. Oh, Father King, will you please intervene on our behalf? We beg of you. It was the most sniveling, groveling language you can imagine. And I don't know about you, but I am keenly interested in trying to understand and know what kind of stories were they telling each other? What stories were they telling each other that convinced them to stop the boot kissing? To stop the groveling and the begging before the king and the rich and the powerful and to find the courage to stand up, to get up off their knees and to put their shoulders back and to put their chin up and look directly at the king. And where did the king claim cultural authority? God to know that the king claimed cultural authority to God and to see behind the king the most powerful military the world had ever assembled and said, you are done, get out, we're doing it different now. Because let me tell you something, folks, that process of standing up like that, that is magic. And I want to be clear, if one person, if just one person stands up against injustice and oppression, and unfairness that is beautiful but it's not magic if one person stands up against the injustice it is courageous it deserves to be applauded but I don't think that alone is magic you see I think the magic happens if one person stands up and somebody to her left stands up to join her and somebody to her right stands up to join her you see the magic happens when a whole group of people stand up together against that and act collectively together that's the magical moment and at this point may I just say may the goddess bless the Occupy movement <laughs> right thank you Occupy Because I gotta tell you something, folks. I was part of the global justice movement in the late 1990s, you know, and I'm proud of the work that we did. But I look at what is happening with the Occupy movement, and I think these are genius organizers. Because you see, I'm proud of the work we did at the global justice movement. Y'all might have heard that me and about 50,000 of my closest friends had a little gathering in Seattle in November of 1999. <laughs> Yep, I can see y'all heard the Battle of Seattle where we shut down the World Trade Organization ministerial meeting uh, that year. And I'm very proud of that work. And I'm proud of the work against the International Monetary Fund and the work against the World Bank and other of these big, huge uh, gatherings of where the ruling elite were coming together. But I look back at my work and our collective work then and compare it to Occupy and I realize this. You know, when we gathered together, or when the ruling elites gathered at these ministerials, we would gather together to protest. And again, I'm not putting us down. I mean, we did good work. We did good organizing, good coalition building. Frankly, we built some dope puppets. If you haven't seen any of them, I mean, we, we brought a lot of, you know, puppetistas uh, to the movement. That was all good. But here's the thing. When the ruling elites left their meetings, what did our movements do? We went away too. Every step of the way. So genius thing number one that Occupy did is they said, hey, you know what? The ruling elites meet every day at Wall Street America. Let's go there. <laughs> genius idea number two. Genius idea number two, and we're not going away because they don't go away. Genius idea number three is if you want to join, we want you to join. And please, you're welcome to come to New York but you don't have to. You can occupy wherever you live, work, and play. If you want to join the Occupy movement, you don't go to the website Occupy Wall Street. The best place to go is Occupy Together. And it will put you in touch with occupiers anywhere on the globe at this point, much less in the United States of America. And fourthly, I've traveled to about 40 or 50 different Occupy uh, efforts all across the country. And everywhere I go, it's almost universal. Almost nobody tells me I know exactly what to do. 
but almost everybody is asking the right questions. And so to me, the fourth genius thing about the Occupy movement is that it dares us, it challenges us to occupy imagination space. To actually imagine a completely different political, economic, and social system. To actually do the work of spending time and building together and actually imagining and challenging one another. I think what Occupy uh, gives us is an opportunity that I frankly have not seen in my entire adult life. So every time I go up to an Occupy uh, grouping, I approach with humility. And I mean that seriously. I have approached those with genuine thanks for what they've done. And any of you who are occupiers, I thank you. And when I offer these teachings and so forth, I offer them as gifts. I have an analysis and we do have a campaign and a plan and we'd like to engage because Move to Amend would never dare to speak for Occupy, but we are eager and happy that we collaborate with Occupy. And the approach that Move to Amend has taken is profoundly different, frankly, than almost all of the other big inside the Beltway nonprofit industrial complex uh, efforts to how, to how you actually relate to Occupy. So Move to Amend will continue, and I am here to say anybody from Occupy Spokane, we would invite the opportunity for dialogue on how we might collaborate, but we don't think for a moment we speak for you, but we want to build with you. Thank you. All right. So we know, we know that the king did get thrown out. And so we know a new charter gets written to create a new governmental structure, a new supreme law of the land, a new document that, that we are taught to, to revere. What is that document called, the supreme law of the land? The U.S. Constitution. How many folks here have actually read the U.S. Constitution? Y'all raise your hand. Look at all those hands go up. So I'm going to challenge you to grade my papers. Y'all see if I get this more or less right. Because I'm going to tell you, when you read the Constitution, and as my mama says, don't just read the words, son. Read the whole thing. Step back from the tapestry. Look at the whole pattern. So I'm going to say, if you read the entire thing about how our government is supposed to operate, I will submit that when you read the Constitution, you'll see two basic actors. The first actor is the most important actor. In fact, it's so important, it's the first three words. <laughs> folks, all I ever have to do is put my hand to my ears, and folks will say, in unison, as you have done, we the people. That's because these are hallowed words in this country, and they should be. You see, we the people come together to create the second actor in this document, which is government itself. I want to stop for a moment and really underscore, in this entire framework, we the people create government. Government does not pre-exist the people. We create the government. That is a very powerful idea. We should really come to terms with that and really think and act like that. And get this. We, the people in this document, are described as being free and sovereign. The king is not sovereign. We kick the king out. But get this. Government isn't sovereign either. What does sovereign mean? The authority to rule. Who has the authority to rule? We, the people, do. Government does not have the authority to rule over us. In fact, in this framework, government is subordinate and accountable. Government is subordinate to whom? We the people. Government is accountable to whom? We the people. That's got a ring to it, doesn't it? I like how this is going. Let's continue. <laughs> See, we the people are free and sovereign because we the people have legal rights. Government does not have rights. Government only has duties. And I want to stop for a moment and really underscore something. The difference between rights and duties is profound. You see, if I have the right to do something, it means I can do it. And I don't need anybody's permission. I don't need this group's permission. I don't need the city of Spokane's permission. I don't need Washington state legislators' permission. I don't need the federal government's permission. Man, I'm from Texas. I don't need my mama's permission. <laughs> If I have the legal right to do something, it means I can just damn well do it. And if government 
local, state, or federal tries to infringe upon my rights to do something I legally have the right to do, government's wrong, not me. That's very important. So here's the point, y'all. We, the people, have rights, government has duties, and government never has rights over the people. Government only has duties. And duties means a responsibility. It's a charge, if you will. If you have a duty, it means you have to do it, right? And where do governmental duties come from? Well, the people. Remember this, folks. All power resides with the people. And by the way, that's another one of those magical phrases. In fact, to illustrate how magical this is, I'm going to do a quick little exercise with y'all. And I'll, you don't have to do this, but I will invite you to, to just check this out and see what you think. I'm going to say four words and ask you to repeat them. I'm going to say, power to the people. I'm going to do that again. Power to the people. Let's do it again. Power to the people. Now look at each other, for real. Just, just look, at the, look at you. Almost everybody is smiling. Right? I mean, seriously. I, and I do this little exercise all over the country, and I do it every night. You know why? For two reasons. One, I want you to experience it. And two, I like it. <laughs> it makes me feel good. You see, I think the phrase power to the people is magic. And it, it's not just the words, because just reading those words doesn't invoke the magic. And honestly, even saying the words doesn't necessarily inv invoke the magic. The magic happens when we say it collectively, when we say it together, and when we say it with conviction, and when we say it in a manner that we believe it, that we have the power, the power to the people. That is a very powerful idea. And before I go any further, may I ask, what is the population more or less of Spokane, Washington? 200,000 more or less? So I will tell you this. I will celebrate and applaud the fact that 200,000 residents of this community have all the political power. That's a wonderful thing. But I'll tell you this, I don't want to go to the meeting where 200,000 people decide where to put stop signs. <laughs> and I like political meetings. I'm not going to that one. Anybody up to facilitating that meeting? Yeah, right. See, the point I'm making is, all power resides with the people, and that's a beautiful thing. However, we the people delegate a certain amount of our power to government. How much power do we delegate to government? Only enough to perform the duties that we the people have already told government that they are responsible to do. Think of it this way. The Constitution is the codification of the social contract. And since I believe that this current social contract is racist, sexist, class oppressive, oh, and is destroying the planet that we depend upon for life itself. May I say, it's time to renegotiate this social contract. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's kind of simple. Anybody who's ever been involved in organized labor understands that time to time you renegotiate contracts, right? It's time to renegotiate this one. But the point I'm making also, folks, is this. When you look at it this way, oh my God, Mrs. Armstrong might have been onto something after all. <laughs> Seriously, watch this. We the people have all the power and we are free and sovereign. We delegate a certain amount of our power to government. Government which is subordinate and accountable to us. We give government only enough power to perform the duties that we have already said that they would do. But the one thing that, and how does government discharge their duties, by the way? By enacting laws at the local, state, or federal level. But the one thing government can never do is pass a law that violates an individual's rights. So you look at it this way and you say, oh my goodness, we have individual or private rights that are sacred and sacrosanct, but there's also a public component to all of this. When you think of it this way, I look at this and I think, oh my gosh, this is brilliant. Our individual civil liberties are to be protected. They're sacred and sacrosanct. Government cannot infringe upon them, no matter what the reason for any of these laws are. But laws also get enacted in order to serve the public interest. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't this brilliant? We should try that in this country. 
I think this would work. <laughs> and I'm not even joking. The problem is not in this framework because before I go one second further waxing poetic about how brilliant and beautiful the U.S. Constitution is, time out. Somebody tell me what year the U.S. Constitution either gets drafted in secret convention or gets ratified and become the supreme law of the land. Either day. Nicely done. 1789. 1787, I heard, that's the Constitutional Convention. But you're right. 1789 is the date that the Constitution becomes the official law of the land. 1789. The reason I want that date certain on the board is so I can ask this follow-up question. Now that we know what legal personhood means, the ability to assert rights, in 1789, who was part of we the people? What were their characteristics? Male. You had to be male. If you're not a man, you're not a person. White! You got to be white. If you're not white, you're not a person. All white men persons? Oh no, you got to be a property owner. You have to have enough wealth. Oh, by the way, you also have to be in the right religion. Yes, if you were, if you were not in the right religion, you were not fully a person. In fact... Thinking of it this way, here's a question. What percentage of the adult human population living in 1789 in those 13 colonies that are now states, what percentage of those adults do you think were actually legal persons? What percentage? One percent. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, a, that's awesome. <laughs> it's a great, hey, listen, it's a great, it's a great frame. It's a great story, the one percent meme. It is wonderful. And actually... In today's standards, if we're really talking about the true, true ruling elite, it's actually about one quarter of one percent, right? I mean, because I'm not talking about just the crazy rich. I'm talking about the crazy, stupid rich. You know, the billionaires upon billionaires. It's a super small minority. But one percent is far too cynical, ma'am. It's not one percent. It's five percent. That's literally about the number. About five percent of the adults living... Uh, uh, in the area that became the United States of America in its inception was actually fully legally a person. Another way to say this is to acknowledge this. For all this beautiful rhetoric and framing, and it is beautiful, the problem is that in its inception, this country was a founding violence against the indigenous people who already lived here and were subject to intentional deliberate genocide. That truth needs to be told. This country, in its inception, for all its beautiful language, was a founding violence against the Africans who were brought at the barrel of a gun or the point of a spear and forced to build this country with slave labor. That horrible truth needs to be told out loud. It's a founding violence against women. Because it's not just that women couldn't vote. That's the least of it. Women couldn't even own property. Women were property by any reasonable definition of that word. And it's a founding violence against most of the white men. Because most of the white men were either indentured servants themselves or at best second class citizens. Right? So it's important to recognize the struggle over legal personhood began from the very beginning of this country. Who got to be a person to assert rights? And I am reminded of the late great historian Howard Zinn. May the goddess rest his soul. <laughs> Howard Zinn, Howard Zinn says, history requires a lens because you're looking back in time. And probably the most important lens to use in looking at U.S. history is as a series of struggles by actual human beings to be described as persons with rights protected by our Constitution. I'm going to say that again because I think it's really important. Probably the most important way to look at all of U.S. history is as a series of struggles by actual human beings to be defined as persons with rights protected by this Constitution. Now, some people might say, all right, Cobb, you got a scathing indictment about imperialism 500 years ago, but hey, man, women can vote. We got rid of slavery. It's all good. <laughs> to which I say, au contraire, mon frere. It ain't all good. It ain't all good at all, because I think that now that I've laid out this framework, right, and we recognize that the struggle over who is a legal person who can assert rights and how important that is, I want to ask this question very quickly. What does it take to form a corporation in Washington today? 
How much? Ten bucks and, and a board you file, or several of you said paperwork. That's right. All you have to do is file your paperwork properly, and as long as you dot your I's and cross your T's and your ten dollar check clears, do you know what the Secretary of State will do? The Secretary of State will cash that check and then issue you a charter. Do you know how long your charter can last in Washington? <laughs> until the next ten dollars is due and as long as you pay that ten dollars do you know how long it will last? Forever! And do you know what you can do with the corporate charter in Washington law today? All leaf lawful things anything legally permissible. That's the Washington corporate code. Some of us observe well if you have enough money and power apparently you can do a lot of illegal things and get away with it but put that aside. The point I'm making is that under, in our contemporary culture, we rarely ask, what is up with these institutions known as corporations that, that seem to have so much power and wealth? We don't even know our own history around them, much less do most of us even know how they're formulated and how they act. The reason I'm pointing out just how easily they're, they're, they, they are both created and how little control over them we have today is to take you back in time to 1789. And now may I please tell you what it took to form a corporation in 1789 in this country and for basically the next 75 years in our country. First, you had to get a bill introduced in the lower house of your state government and that bill had to pass by a majority. Then that same bill had to go to the upper house of the state senate and it had to pass by a majority. And then the governor had to be willing to sign it. It was the functional equivalent of passing a state law. Anybody besides me lobbied to get a state law passed? Anybody? A couple of hands go up. So how hard is that? <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a legal term of art. It's crazy hard. Right? I mean, it really, uh, the mechanics are just very difficult. The point I'm making is just the mechanical application process for creating a corporate charter from the founding of this country and for the next 75 years was a very high threshold. And get this, the substance, you had to identify a public need that was not being met by either existing governmental action or by private business that did not have the privilege of limited liability. And if you were going to be given the privilege of incorporation all you could ever do was the specific public need that you had already identified. And if you did any other kind of business other than the very narrowly tailored uh, public need that you had already addressed, do you know what happened to your corporate charter? <laughs> the corporate charter could be revoked. Oh, and by the way, do you know how long your corporate charter would last? Three years, five years, seven years. The point is, every corporate charter was written with a limited time duration. And at the end of that time, the, the privileges of corporate of incorporation and limited liability just dissolved. And if you wanted to continue to do that kind of work with limited liability, you had to go through the application process all over again. Oh, and by the way, even if you were doing the limited thing that you had been granted your corporate charter to do, even if you were in the limited time period that you had been granted your corporate charter, if you ever were found to do anything that violated the public interest or the public trust, do you know what happened to that corporate charter? <laughs> revoked. Corporate charters were routinely revoked in this country. Now, I'm not here to tell you this was the land of milk and honey. Of course not. Because in 1789, we had slavery. We were, women were being subjected to uh, tyrannical oppression. Workers were being systematically repressed. But what I am telling you is that the corporation as an instrument was appropriately controlled. That's all I'm saying. And I'm pointing out this is our historic legacy. This is not just David Cobb's wishful thinking. This is not just move to amends approach, although it is. This is a recognition that this is our history, that this is once the way we treated these instruments known as corporations. Again, it's not a problem with what the corporation is, it's a problem of our political and economic and legal systems, right? And so now that we understand that it takes an action of state government to create a corporation, 
Now that we understand that that corporate charter can be used to hold the corporation subordinate and accountable, now that we understand that the corporate charter describes the duties of what a corporation can or cannot do, since we now understand that, and I will submit, we should only allow corporations to exist if they're actually serving the public interest, isn't it obvious that a corporation should be on this side of the line, that a corporation should be under the proper democratic control of we the people? Isn't that just obvious? And here's the payoff, y'all. When the United States Supreme Court, in an act of supreme judicial activism, says even though the word corporation is never used in the U.S. Constitution, we're going to say that we in our society must treat a corporation as if it's a person with rights, and that perverts the whole framework. See, corporate personhood is not just an illogical idea, which it is. Corporate personhood is not just a stupid idea, which it is. Corporate personhood, I believe, deeper corporations being able to claim constitutional rights is a linchpin for how the ruling elite have hijacked our country from us. They have hijacked our ability to govern ourselves. And what? makes me outraged as a lawyer is that they use our legal system to justify and legalize it. They've stolen the legal institutions, the place where we are taught to believe that we go for justice. The idea is if you've ever been aggrieved, if you have, a, uh, if you have been wronged, you should be able to go to courts, to go to the law, because the law is blind, the law is fair, the law is just, and it doesn't matter what color you are, what gender you are, how much money you make, the idea that we are taught is we have respect for the law because these are the institutions where justice is fairly administered. And it pisses me off that the ruling elite have illegitimately challenged us, we the people, from our right to govern ourselves and use the legal system to pervert the framework. Ya yeah, basta! Enough already! It's our constitution. It's our government. It's our society. And folks, that's why at Move to Amend, we have come together with the idea that we must amend the constitution to one, abolish in its entirety the idea that a corporation has any constitutional rights. Corporations are created by we the people and may I say that includes for-profit and non-profit corporations. Non-profits do not have constitutional rights either. You can applaud that. We need to stand strong on this so that we can bring principled conservatives into this movement. It is the only intellectually honest way to talk about this idea. Only human beings have inherent inalienable constitutional rights. <laughs> Number two. We must abolish in its entirety the ridiculous idea created also by the courts that money equals speech. You see, I don't want to do all the work of abolishing corporate constitutional rights only to be told that, oh, but you know what? Rich people can still spend unlimited amounts of money to completely control and corrupt the political process. Likewise, I don't want to do all the work to get corporate money and special interest money completely out of elections only be, to be told, oh, but we're going to still allow corporate lawyers to go into court and overturn environmental protection laws, worker safety laws, public health laws, and campaign finance laws. Don't you see, folks, the reason that Move to Amend is growing so rapidly, I believe, honestly, is because we have been clear and unequivocal. Our demand, abolish all corporate constitutional rights, abolish the legal idea that a corporation is a person. I do want to point this out, folks. This movement and tonight's event was not covered by corporate media at all, no. right? But I do want to give a big shout out to any of you who are watching me right now. Let's just acknowledge you're watching it on people's media. Wherever it is that you're watching me right now, some unpaid volunteer took the time to record it. Thank you. Some unpaid volunteer took the time to upload this to create the infrastructure for you to watch it. So we got to support people's media. Right? We got to support people's media. And yes, 
to the local cable access program that this is going to be played on. And also, can we get a big shout out to your community radio station? And it is a people's own, people's operated radio station. Let's admit that we're going to tell the truth about what we're up to and what we're up against and what is up against us because I believe that by telling that truth it will reveal to us where our commonalities are, what our strategies ought to be and what we ought to do to actually transition away. And away from what I believe is a suicidal death march and transition us into the peaceful, just, compassionate world that we're carrying in our hearts and is within our grasp if we'll just reach out for it. You see, we want to live in liberty, justice, and equality. And I'll do you one better. We deserve to live in liberty, justice, and equality. And may I say that it is true that American children want and deserve to live in liberty, justice, and equality. But we do not want those things because we are Americans. We want those things because we're human beings. And yes, American children want liberty, justice, and equality. And so do Iraqi children and Afghan children, and Israeli children, and Palestinian children, and Mexican children. You know, the point I'm making is that this, if we do it right, and if we open our hearts, and we really talk about it in the right way, we can be participatory in helping to create a genuine human rights movement, a worldwide democracy movement. That's really where I'd like to be getting, and you know what? If we're really visionary, if we're really honest and if we're really courageous, we might even start talking about not only the human rights of our sisters and brothers across nation states, but we start talking about the rights of the forest and the streams and of deer and of birds. And we start to actually imagine a global new movement that recognizes the interconnectedness of all things and that we are going to usher in an entire new social, political, and economic system in which we recognize, salute, and celebrate life itself. Isn't that wonderful? Can't we do that? That's actually what I think we ought to be about. Let's build alternative people's media so that we can talk to each other and let's have those kind of conversations and let's build political power that is serious, that takes ourselves seriously because we have to. Because a just world is at stake and frankly, not only a peaceful and just world, but we know that the ecology that we depend upon for life itself is in the balance. So let's do our work joyously, but let's also be serious about it. Peace. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.